Greetings, everyone, and welcome to this episode of the Hired Geek Podcast, episode number 81, with Helen Zhu. Uh, she has a lot going on. She's working at UPenn, uh, uh, doing some advising work there, completing some graduate coursework in organizational dynamics, and also getting started with her own podcast uh, through her sorority. Um, so doing a lot of cool stuff. She has a lot of uh, geeky uh, kind of diverse interests as well that we'll talk about in this episode. Uh, but just another uh, kind of preface here. Uh, this is one that recorded several weeks ago before everything going on uh, right now is even uh, uh, kind of on our minds. And we were all just starting to, to kind of go through watching uh, Love is Blind that you'll hear us uh, talk about. We hadn't uh, since moved on to Tiger King yet. Uh, so um, a little bit uh, dated uh, since just the world and everything is changing so quickly, but um, still a really awesome episode. Really appreciate uh Helen, who is a fellow Delawarean that we'll discover on this episode, really appreciate her taking out time and uh, talking about all that she did and uh, find ways to connect with her. And I'll be talked about down in the show notes. Uh, but thanks so much for listening. And without further ado, this is episode number 81 with Helen Zhu. All right. Well, uh, thank you so much, Helen, for uh, jumping onto the podcast here. Uh, really excited to, to catch up with you. I know we kind of briefly crossed paths in uh, grad school, but it's been a long time since then. So mm-hmm. a lot to cover and everything. And uh, as someone that's uh, also dabbling in the podcasting world, excited to uh, talk about that and everything else. So um, we will go ahead and get started as we always do. If you want to give a brief introduction of yourself and how you got to be where you are today. Sure thing. Thanks so much, Dustin, for having me. So my name is Helen Zhu, and I, like Dustin said, had crossed paths with him at Rutgers University for grad school. I'm a proud Penn Stater, I will say, but then I turned into a Rutgers Scarlet Knight briefly. And if that wasn't enough, betrayal enough, then I went to the University of Wisconsin-Madison right after grad school. So had my fair share of Big Ten schools. Mm -hmm. The functional areas have really uh, been quite unique. So when I first started my student affairs uh, trajectory, it was in the office of the Dean of Students. So that's where I was at in supporting students in stress, distress, and crisis, and also had intern in the Asian American Cultural Center. So that had really enlightened me into the work of um, supporting students of color. And that was such a valuable thing that Rutgers had given me, which is why I ended up working at the Multicultural Student Center at UW-Madison. While I was there, it was for not too, too long, actually. I was there for a little bit over a year. And uh, the reason why I returned back to this side of the country was really more for personal reasons. Um, But also, there was this opportunity. So I was working in spaces where I felt like I was doing valuable work, but also constantly preaching to the choir. So I kind of looked at it through the lens of how can I still support students of color, support student organizations from a different vantage point. So I ended up at the University of Pennsylvania working in fraternity and sorority life, which was something that I really had not considered in advance. But that is what made it so appealing because it was a non-traditional way to integrate either diversity education or be able to um work with students, but still through an identity lens. Um, And then actually over the summer, I had transitioned into a role that is a little bit outside of student affairs, still do a bunch of student affairs work, but uh, my primary role is an academic advisor at the School of Nursing, still at Penn. And um, it's been about eight months now. Very cool. Um, Yeah, definitely a a lot of uh, different experiences, but kind of I assume a lot of people, you know, nowadays, uh, you know, it's kind of how it is, I guess, is, is that if you are seeking to maybe kind of like Goldilocks your way towards like, you know, the type of institution, the type of team, the type of work that you want to do, you can kind of uh, strive towards that and any individual's kind of interest to do that. Because I think if you kind of go too far down a path that might not be where you really want to end up, you, you know, you may not be, I mean, it's not, I guess, certainly a detriment, there's going to be a lot of transferable skills, but you know, it serves you to, if you're just sort of like, you know what, I really feel like there's something more, something better out there, or, you know, you can at least just uh, 
try something out and just make sure that you're making the most of each opportunity that you can. So yeah, it's interesting because I think like, yeah, I've, I've had sort of like two years each play, you know, like after that time, so kind of like itching, you mm-hmm. know, for a new challenge, something different. Um, and I, I feel like it's been helpful because I'm like I'm absolutely soaking up all that I can each right. place as sort of like a way station on you know, my continual career journey. So do, do you feel like that's what it's been like for you kind of like going to all these different institutions and very different teams and uh, sort of functional areas, like you've been able to kind of like soak up quite a bit to, to keep continuing serving you professionally like as you keep moving on yeah absolutely I feel like at the very core what is important to me which is uh supporting students in their success at the institution academically but through an identity lens has continued to be the case whether it was working with student organizations directly um or one-on-one advising. I feel like on paper, it seems so random. I I just jumped from um, various different types of offices, but really every progression seems so natural. And again, I felt like it was an opportunity that was presented to me. Um, And I guess the thing that ties it all together is I want to be able to support or instill messages in the most non-traditional ways. So for example, the students coming in for one-on-one academic advising, what I'm hoping that they'll also walk away with is a whole bunch of other things that also support their success. Are they getting connected right with the right campus resources? Are they also being able or are if they're also able to contribute their ideas to wellness initiatives in our school and I feel very lucky that I'm able to uh, walk down the hall and get to know students. Um, I I work at Penn Nursing where there are about 1,000 students and it it feels small on a campus that is about 10,000 undergrads, 10,000 graduate students. Um, So it's pretty different than some of the other institutions that I've been at. Mm. Yeah. Um, well, then I guess, you know, uh, what I always like to hear, and certainly, you know, it's very uh, relevant and kind of uh, salient uh, in terms of the, uh, you know, higher ed people uh, that I have on the show is sort of like thinking back to your own college experience. Obviously, you mentioned being a proud Penn Stater. Um, so, you know, if it is those sort of professional values or sort of, um, you know, the way that you approach this work or just anything personally too, I guess, you know, whatever comes to mind um, in terms of like, what do you feel like your own, you know, undergraduate college experience gave to you personally and or professionally? So whatever you feel like is kind of top of mind with that. Sure. Yeah, I, I definitely was a fan of Penn State. And even though I, I still don't understand football, but you know, that that institution, <laughs> I guess, football, you know? yeah. <laughs> really instilled something in you. Um, so when I, I, I grew up in Delaware, and I think for me, specifically, it was in a very predominantly white area. And at that point in my racial identity development, I just really did not know how to manage my emotions around my racial identity. So when I went to Penn State, it was also with the secret intention that I wanted to have access to a diverse array of people, whether that's ethnicity. And granted, I didn't have all the words to say that Mm -hmm. when I was 18 years old, but that's kind of what I was longing for, something bigger, something that um, I could maybe feel a little bit more comfortable with myself. And I think joining different student organizations, specifically my sorority, Alpha Kappa Delta Phi, had really just been the the diving board into so much other opportunities on a big campus. Um, I always thought about Janet Helms' racial identity theory, and I remember learning about it in class and being like, whoa, this is wild that everything pertains to my own experiences where it started off with being very white centric. All things were good. I remember a point in my life where if someone said, Oh, Helen, you're like so whitewashed. I remember thinking that was such a big compliment at the time. And then if I were to 
reflect back into then when I joined the sorority, it, it was, it started out being like, I, I was very resistant. I, I was a bit reluctant to kind of dive in head on the deep end of the pool at that point. Um, it ended up really transforming my life and I can genuinely wholeheartedly say that, um, and then in Helms' theory, then my entire circle became very Asian American. So this is an Asian interest sorority, um, had done a lot of work in just multicultural student spaces, but otherwise just more so community building, ended up being an orientation leader like Penn State or college in general gave me something to be excited about, um, something that encouraged me to think for myself. And I attribute a lot of that to things that happened outside of the classroom. I also had a classroom with 700 people in it. So mm. um, it was, it, it, there was a lot of variance, that's for sure. Yeah. Um, well, and I guess I, maybe I like forgot or just like, I didn't realize, cause I remember always looking in each cohort, cause there was kind of a tradition of like somebody who graduated from University of Delaware. Um, mm -hmm. So there was usually there several cohorts. I don't know if it's, the streak is still going, but um it, it was going pretty strong for a while. Um, but I didn't realize that you grew up in Delaware because I also grew up in Delaware, which I feel like oh. is just such a weird mark of honor <laughs> because it's such a small state. And I feel like a lot of people kind of stick around. But um, I can certainly also uh, resonates, I guess, of just like, yeah, not a terribly diverse state for sure. So um, I, I can imagine that being quite a uh, sort of transition going to Penn State as just this, you know, massive, uh, diverse institution and stuff, or even just more relatively diverse than uh, Delaware. So, Yeah, definitely. And I appreciate you saying that, and especially K through 12. And this is a pattern across the nation. It's, um, it, it really makes a difference. Um, and then I, I think college really allows you depending on where you go and how open one is to different opportunities i i think just diversity of thought is going to be incredibly important so mm -hmm. i i like to be a part of that as well still mm -hmm. to this day yeah that's great um yeah i appreciate you sharing that um so i guess you know that brings you to uh now you know you've had all these different experiences um all the way from undergrad to everything that you've done uh, professionally and everything. So kind of where you are now, if you want to dig in a little bit deeper in terms of uh, your current works, so you've been doing it for several months and just, you know, what excites you? What do you enjoy most about your current work? Um, and maybe this can be where if you want to bring in, you know, the opportunities that you've had to do uh, your own podcasting and some of these side projects sort of things. So um, just kind of where you are now, if you want to just explore sort of your current state and what you're uh, enjoying most about what you're doing now. Sure. So currently in my academic advisor role, I also am the student services side of things and connecting students with the right resources, potentially those who may be um, facing a challenge in the curriculum. And I feel like the best part of my job is really being able to dig deeper and probably deeper than a student expects when they first come into my office since um and I feel like that is such an honor, too, to be able to get to know a student below the surface and put together a, what otherwise could be an incredibly jumbled puzzle and help them identify the next steps. And a lot of the coursework that I'm learning, so I'm in an organizational dynamics master's program at the mm -hmm. moment um, with a concentration in coaching and consulting. And what does it look like when I just learn to ask good questions, thoughtful questions? And I found that to be um, so far pretty effective. I definitely always reiterate that I'm not a trained clinician by any means, but I feel like we're able to get somewhere and I feel lucky to be a part of that. Um, I also get to email the entire school of nursing and say there are like a bunch of cookies in the lobby and we have events where all faculty and staff members will just bake a bunch of treats and bring them in during finals. Uh, it feels cool to also manage the wellness initiatives in whatever form that comes up for students um, or for staff or for faculty and be able to just 
build and co-create a definition of that for one school. It feels um, controlled and feels personal. Um, some of the other things I also still volunteer for, uh, the sorority that I mentioned earlier, I serve on the national alumni board. This is my fifth year in uh, various different capacities. I also had created a podcast really just trying to make Asian American voices more Vi uh, visible, I guess wouldn't be the right word, but really just creating a space to hear stories. And I know for me that was missing definitely growing up in Delaware. And I remember turning to YouTube just for the random people um, across the country to just see someone who looked like me or may have shared a similar type of experience and um, now that our sorority's membership is advancing in their careers um, we have alums who are in their 40s what does that now look like for uh, our current active membership and how do we just keep learning from each other because like those stories are still missing you really have to go out of your way to find them and um the podcast is just one way and giving back to the sorority is one way um just hoping to just pay it forward yeah absolutely um well and like it kind of connects to that idea of like really because at the court yeah again like you're not like a clinician or counselor you know like a licensed counselor in terms of just like asking good questions and you know dialoguing with people but you know, certainly a fundamental of any organization is just how well do we communicate with each other. And, you know, mm. podcasting is a good way to sort of like, you know, keep working out that muscle of just trying to, you know, communicate in a really uh, kind of clear and concise and confident way and being, um, yeah, just being able to hear people and just, yeah, I, I know it's been something that's really helped me doing that. And I think it definitely feels like it's going to be kind of a a sort of symbiotic uh, thing of just that uh, master's program you're in and, you know, just for your work every day, but also uh, serving uh, the platform that you're trying to give to raise up mm. a lot more um, diverse voices in terms of, uh, you know, I'm sure like you said, I mean, like these people, it's, you know, they might be reflecting back on their own college experience in, the, in that same way, you know, that you just did and just how that sort of served them now and, you know, the community of the whole sorority, like it's just so much stuff because obviously like it, giving it that respect and wanting to honor, you know, uh, the platform and everyone's stories, just being a good communicator really helps with that of just really helping to, you know, have the conversation go really well. So um, I'm excited to see all of that be kind of just like, you know, interacting in a really uh, great way uh, for you and for, you know, all the people that you're uh, working with and all the students that you're serving and all that good stuff. So, um, yeah, I sure hope so. Thanks. Yeah. Yeah. It's really great. Um, so, you know, with any of those things that you do, or just like, personally fulfilling things. I always like to hear, you know, what people are geeking out about right now, you know, like what's grabbing your attention, um, whether it is, you know, more professionally related or personally, if it's new stuff, stuff you've always been into, um, mm. anything like that. So what, what comes to mind in terms of what you are geeking out about right now? Well, I think you started off part of the podcast saying dabbling, and I feel like I am an expert dabbler. <laughs> so I'm also glad that you defined what I'm geeking out currently because you know last year was making my own kombucha in my apartment mm. well today <laughs> it is food photography because and that's surely been something that I've been uh very interested in probably ever since I had a phone that had a camera recently got um a new phone it's a google pixel i would highly mm. recommend um but uh i often take pictures of me holding something in my hand so recently i've been trying to launch pick up my non-existent fan base of my instagram handle thumb and some which is uh just photos of my thumb and some food, um, whether that is dessert, ice cream, wherever it is that I've traveled in this world and I feel like this want or this desire to just capture all of my thoughts. And maybe that's because some days I feel like I don't have a good memory, but um, anytime that I've been able to travel somewhere or have a delicious food, fan of it all, but the combination together of just 
food travel photography has been something that I've been very consistent about. So as I dabble in plants, as I dabble in fitness, food photography will remain thumb and some. Who knows where that will go? <laughs> but I, I know I'll be taking pictures of food for the rest of my life. Yeah. Um, well, and yeah, I mean, it's like just kind of a dedicated digital journal. And, um, you know, yeah, even if it's kind of just for yourself, it's just there for you to uh, look back and reflect on. Um, but yeah, I mean, it, it, seemed, it sounds like, I mean, it because the taxonomy of sort of like nerd geek and like those sort of things, I feel like that is the idea of somebody who's geeky, which I certainly uh, identify with this is that sort of dabbler, like you're not getting super deep into any one thing, you just like to sort of uh, dabble and sample and sort of uh, experience the wide breadth of the world and humanity and, you know, all these really cool things versus like getting nerdy and like really focused on like one thing and you know everything about it and all that you know that's how i've always kind of like compartmentalized it in my brain um which like both are fine you know it's really cool but uh -huh. way, i'd like to know a little bit about a lot of things and um it's very cool that you made your own kombucha because i've gotten into that uh, myself just uh there's some cool uh places here in baltimore where you can like uh you put in a bottle deposit and you get a bottle and you sort of return it back to the place that you bought it and you then can buy oh. a new one. So it's kind of very circular. Um, and yeah, they just make very delicious kombucha. So um, I definitely am uh, a frequent that quite a bit uh, since I've been here. Oh, but, very nice. Um, yes. Yeah. Well, I had to stop that because the scoby that was living in my closet became like seven inches thick and I knew that it was not usable and it, it, it started to kind of uh, freak me out a little bit that every time I would open my closet, there would be like this little jar. Actually, it was a very big jar that I had to like constantly feed sugar and like uh, make sure it was um, fed. It, it was just starting to um, be a lot. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, well, no, because I think that happens when people make like, um, like bread. Why am I, I'm spacing on the, the kind of bread, but yeah, you have to like nurse the uh, oh yeah sourdough right right yeah you gotta like take yeah, anything care of it. with yeah. yeast if you um, brew your own beer all of that stuff you gotta just make sure is live and active right well, and yeah so that, i think that's the idea that like any of those things yeah like making sourdough and all these like you've got to get kind of like nerdy about that like, you've got to like be like fully committed to you know nurturing <laughs> that thing versus just like no oh, yeah you know i've just got this and it's like oh man I, you know <laughs> Forgot and now about I know it, so why like, it's so expensive. You know, right. Um, <laughs> you know, so it's like somebody else is really good at this and they've, you know, honed their craft. So I'm more than happy to, uh, you know, support them <laughs> for doing that. Uh, but uh, well, and then it's, uh, yeah, it's like you can say that, like, I have made my own kombucha because, like, I, I've talked to people where it's like, and I, I imagine I would do it at some point just for that sort of honorary uh, kind of accomplishment or whatever is making my own beer because I love craft beer and there's a lot mm, of great craft mm -hmm. beer in Baltimore and just being able to say like I've made my own beer and it's like I probably would not always do it because I'm sure it's a lot of work and it might not be, might be actually that tasty but um, just being able to say that I've done it and you can say that you've made your own kombucha. Uh, yes absolutely yeah. I uh, speaking of I have a bunch of Baltimore mead which I still don't really know what that is in, in my fridge from the last time I went um, I don't even know. I don't even know if that's beer. It, well, it's in the family. I mean, it's uh, okay. <laughs> I mean, like beer, but made with honey, I, I think, you know. Um, uh, so, um, yeah, but it's all kind of blurring now because it's like you go you go to some tap room or something. They've got like craft wine, cider, beer, mead, right? and it's all just sort of like in the same family. They're all like cousins, you know, it's just like, how do you make, <laughs> like, what do you make it? It's just like a, you know, artisan alcohol beverage, you know. Um, because a kombucha technically has like a little bit of alcohol in it, so it's all just sort of you know. Yes, it's you know. true. Um, well, I guess you know anything. I guess when you reflect on that of your sort of like your geeky life of dabbling and doing all these different things and you know photography, all that you know, I guess you kind of mentioned you know it is that sort of kind of journaling experience of sort of like taking a moment to be like, what do I feel right now? Let me take a picture and like, you know, uh, write things down or whatever. But, you know, how do you see any of your hobbies sort of like positively contributing to your life? If it is sort of uh, that just sort of introspection, that reflection, if it's community or, you know, just the challenge of like learning something new, like what, what comes to mind in terms of like how all these things kind of, you know, give something back positive to your life. Your last comment challenge of learning something new definitely resonates with me. I feel like I like being known as someone who my colleagues can come up to and be like, 
Helen, I feel like you would know the answer to this, or maybe you know a little bit about that. Um, just because I like to try things like log rolling when I lived in Wisconsin, mm-hmm. ice fishing. Um, and I feel like the breadth of experiences has surely made me feel a lot happier. A lot of it's also rooted in gratitude. And like you mentioned, documenting things, I have really made an active effort to appreciate all things good and bad and move forward. And um, I think being able to try different hobbies and interests have just made me very appreciative of all the different things that are out there. Um, And I know for me, when I feel really overwhelmed with either work and school or sometimes at the same time, then um, really not necessarily unplugging completely, but replugging elsewhere and replugging elsewhere in a lot of different directions feels good for me. So Uh we'll continue to do that. Yeah. Yeah. Variety being the spice of life and all that jazz. So, um, uh, cool. Well, I guess then I'm curious, you know, with that sort of idea of kind of the breadth of experience being really valuable, like I'm very curious what you might recommend in terms of stuff that you are, uh, reading, watching and, or listening to, um, anything that you'd want to recommend that we can put in the show notes. So, um, you know, it could be literally things that you are consuming right now or have recently kind of gotten through or, any like classics for you that you'd want to just like the tip of the hat to, but, uh, I love the Trader Joe's podcast. I feel like I would have never imagined two seasons worth of talking about their chocolate process Mm. or whatever it may be. I going along the lines of knowing a little bit about everything. I love listening to stuff you should know and, being able to rattle off random facts about MC Escher. Um, How I Built This is by far my favorite podcast. And I don't have an entrepreneur mindset, but I love, again, hearing the stories about things that exist. And I think that's my opportunity to do so. Um, A huge, huge fan of Adam Grant, who I know is on the same campus as me at UPenn. Um, one day, if I ever cross paths, I will. It, it'll be a celebrity sighting. I, <laughs> I love his podcast it's so like much. Freak out, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> um, so that's that's really what I've been using some of my energy outside of just coursework readings. Yeah, um, which it is like I feel like podcast celebrity is similar. Like if you're like a YouTube celebrity or whatever, like. Because I'm sure to certain people like Adam Grant, they're like, oh, who is that? Whatever. And like, are you kidding me? Like, like this dude <laughs> makes so much good stuff, right? You know, like, you know, like you write so much good stuff and you have podcasting now and all that. Like, um, but yeah, it's, it's just a weird level of uh, celebrity. Um, but um, yeah, I mean, he's, he's amazing. And I feel like those are like some of the uh, kind of greatest hits podcast of like everybody that's been on the show. A lot of people recommend. Um, uh, uh-huh. stuff. So uh, you were in good company. Um, <laughs> but, uh, yeah, so we'll link out to those. Um, and I guess I don't know if you're like me, cause like reading is like always a struggle, <laughs> but, uh, do you have any like books or anything, anything else, I guess, of like stuff that you're watching or list or watching or reading that, um, you'd want to recommend, I guess, anything top of mind there. Yes. The book that really stands out is getting to yes. And, I believe it was written probably decades ago, but the message is still so clear. I think um, the author is Yuri, spelled U-R-Y, and it a lot of it is the fundamentals of just how to build consensus or how to give others a stake in the solution for the sake of trying to get somewhere or come to a decision. Um, this idea of using judo, jujitsu, or this concept that is in alignment with judo or jujitsu of not necessarily using the other person's strength, but more so how do you manage the circumstances to make it work for you? So not necessarily about 
power, but more so how do you use that energy? Mm-hmm. So I think that's helped me really frame, not necessarily I have to like learn all these skills. I have to do all these things. I have to keep like getting more degrees or even in conflicts or in situations where there is conflict, not necessarily um, pressing back for the sake of it. Uh, that's not really in my um, natural like personality anyways, but mm-hmm. how do I use that energy for some type of solution and ultimately not harm me, but help me be better. Yeah. Um, yeah. I feel like that's kind of who I am as well. <laughs> so uh, that resonates <laughs> out to me bookmark that uh, book, but um, yeah, that's really good. Uh, sort of just like general life lesson in all things. Um, yeah. So that's good. Um, yeah. But uh, I guess, yeah. Anything else, anything else you'd want to recommend? Cause it's always like really good when you can have like, a super robust like library in the show notes of just like podcast books and like I don't know, stuff to watch or whatever. So another book that I've read and they're all kind of in the same like realm is adaptive space or there's this book. I don't know if maybe it's a workbook called liberating structure. So I've been really big on this idea of on unleashing the potential of the group. What does um, you know, this agility or organizations being agile Mm. is the direction that we're going to definitely over on the West coast with all the different startups, but what does that look like in really hierarchical spaces? So I one adaptive spaces is written by um, now currently one of the chief talent officers at Amazon. Um, But previously when I took his class was working for general motors and what does design thinking look like? like in this field what does design thinking look like in that field is it even possible so i really just been trying to wrap my brain around all of that um and then liberating structures and i think it has a, a fuller name is this handbook this manual of 32 30 plus different strategies and the intention is to make meetings suck less and i love that idea of just trying to, um, one, facilitate a conversation where all voices at different points of the organization can contribute, um, create the psychological safety where people are able to speak freely with the intention to be solution-oriented. And I've been able to practice some of that in not only my classes, but in the work that I do. And I found it to be extremely helpful and relevant. So instead of, for example, instead of like sending out an email and saying, um, hello, everyone, if you have any wellness ideas or different types of initiatives that you would love to see, um, send me an email or let me know. I know that I would get like one or two responses, if anything, maybe like five from those people who actually really care. But if I really want to start um, distilling or defining what wellness means in my current workspace or whatever it may be, then I really need to capture the thoughts and ideas of everyone or as many people as I can get from all different perspectives. Um, So I feel like using these liberating structure strategies has really helped me um, facilitate short, quick, easy ways to get people talking. And that's a uh, very great sentiment as we uh, start to wrap up the podcast here, because I think that that's definitely like a very uh, shared feeling between, you know, having that kind of optimism of sort of, you know, um, the outcomes and the goals we want to have as a department or an institution, any sort of organization, really is still going to hinge either on making sure you're doing things the right way or, you know, getting really valuable input is about communication. Or if you're trying to do something, change something, start something, you know, you're going to have to communicate about that. So that's something I'm certainly optimistic about. I think it's a 
a good challenge to have, you know, like a good opportunity any of us would be able to have. But um, mm-hmm. so kind of with all that that you've mentioned, like all these things that you're thinking about, all these things that you're doing um, and geeking out about and all that kind of stuff. So, you know, we always wrap up the episode with talking about something or things that you are looking forward to in your job, life and or the world. So if you want to knock it out of the park with all three or just any one of those, it's kind of <laughs> top of mind. Um, yeah, just anything that uh, you'd want to share. The first thing that comes to mind is I am ready for and looking forward to the final episode of Love is Blind on Netflix <laughs> that is released tomorrow. I, I, like, I feel like I, I don't know. Like, I feel like everybody's talking about that right now. So yeah, it's very, very appropriate. No one has talked about it with me and I would <laughs> gladly talk about it with someone because I need to know. Yeah, my wife watches it a lot. So. <laughs> oh, well, I, I'm hoping that tomorrow morning it will be available. Um, but otherwise, the big thing that I'm looking forward to is ultimately graduation. I have a, two more courses left. I'm looking forward to writing my capstone. Like I said, like this this idea of how to integrate design thinking into higher education, and you know, it needs to be narrowed down a little bit, but. Um, I'm looking forward to writing this 80 some page paper. I wasn't before, but now that I actually have some type of concept, that is something that is looming, Um, exploring the idea of what it looks like to fail fast, who can fail fast, who cannot fail fast, what are the conditions to do so. Um, Yeah, I'm looking forward to getting that up and running. It's like one of those things I feel like is kind of all consuming uh, in one's life when you're in school and doing uh, kind of these final big projects and everything. But it's obviously personally fulfilling for us uh, when we go on a journey like that. But um, definitely great that you're really integrating it uh, wholeheartedly into um, the work that you're doing uh, in higher ed, because I think that that's absolutely the kind of uh, thinking, the kind of perspectives we need uh, to bring in to really be. Um, supporting students to the best of our ability and, you know, driving really positive change, uh, in institutions. So, um, that is very cool stuff. And I appreciate you, uh, just giving that little teaser. And I guess as of the recording of this, I mean, this will go out a little while later. So it's, uh, I guess, um, when it comes out, the world will have, uh, watched love is blind and we will all collectively <laughs> have, uh, processed together, I guess. But, uh, at this point in time <laughs> is prior to that, uh, what I'm sure will be an infamous, uh, infamous day, but, um, <laughs> so, uh, yeah, I mean, best of luck with, uh, finishing everything up and I, I guess how, like by the end of this year, I get like this calendar year, should you be done with all of your like courses and everything? Or I don't know if that's like by May or like by the yes, end. Yes, hopefully by the summer and nice. with the intention to do something in May, but who knows uh, right now, just trying to get through Thursday. <laughs> Yeah, that's, uh, that's certainly fair. Um, great. Well, I really appreciate your time and all that you shared. And we'll have everything linked down in the show notes that we talked about and uh, ways to connect with you as well. But um, yeah, just thank you so much for your time. Uh, really great uh, talking with you. Not a problem. Likewise. This podcast is part of the Connect EDU podcast network, bringing together diverse voices in the higher ed community. Check us out on Twitter at Connect EDU pod or at connectedu.network. Thanks for listening to this episode of the podcast. Make sure to rate, review, and subscribe so you never miss an episode. Thanks again for listening, and we'll see you in the next episode of the Higher Ed Geek Podcast.